Um, I'm going to turn this, con uh, this session over. This is on HIV and AIDS. And I got to tell you that out of all of the sessions that we had planned, this is the one that I'm most excited about. Reason being that, as you may know, over the past several years, the attention on HIV and AIDS has been global. Now, I'm not knocking global. Global's good. But without focus on what's going on here in the United States, you would almost think that we had it licked, that it's all good. But we know that it's not. We know that we're still losing people. We know that people still aren't getting the messages. And we know that there's a lot of work to do here. So with that, I turn it over to our moderator, Sherry Williams. Excuse me, the fabulous Sherry Williams. Good morning, everyone. I have to tell you, I am so excited, not just about this panel, because I'm really passionate about um, this disease and how it impacts our people, but I am really excited about this Health Disparities Conference. I've been a reporter for 11 years, and I've been a member of NABJ for almost 10 years, and I have to tell you, I'm kind of getting misty a little bit right now, because in the decade that I have been affiliated with this um, organization, this Health Disparities Conference is one of the most significant and important things that I've seen this this organization do because the stories and the connections that have come out of this and the information that has gone to our people has been so phenomenal. So I really want to express my thanks to Andrea King Collier, Doug Mitchell, um, Irving Washington and Ryan Williams and Kaiser for partnering with us to do this because this is really, um, a, these are really significant issues that are affecting our community and I'm really, really glad that NABJ is doing this for the second consecutive year. Um, but with that being said, we had um, Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Sebelius with us yesterday. And she told us that for the first time, right now, for the first time since 1987, that there is now a national focus on HIV and AIDS. And her quote to paraphrase was, our foot has been off the pedal for a while. And while the foot has been off the pedal, our people have suffered. And we want and we need to write about that and report that story more. So we've gathered this really knowledgeable and passionate panel to talk to you today. So what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce everyone very quickly, and we're going to have them um, give, up, give us some comments. They really want to hit some high points to give you some information that you'll need that you probably won't get anywhere else. So we're going to allow them to do that, and then we'll open up to questions. Um, first, we have Greg Millett, a senior policy advisor with the White House Office on National AIDS policy. We have Phil Wilson, the founder and executive director of the Black AIDS Institute, LaShawn Meyer with the Center for Policy Analysis and Research, Vanessa Johnson, the De deputy executive director of the National Association of People with AIDS, and Gulda Downer, the principal investigator and assistant professor with the National Minority AIDS and Education Training Center at Howard University. So what I'm going to do right now is just turn it over to Greg and have you um, hit some points that you definitely want people and some information you want us to walk away with. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I, I want to thank NABJ for the invitation as well as Kaiser to speak at this conference. Um, before I speak though, I, I have to admit that I had PowerPoint slides that are available and one of the worst things that you can say to a scientist is that you're not going to be using PowerPoint uh, because we're just so used to conveying statistics in a graphical manner. Uh, but I'll, I'll do my best to just try and um, lay out some of the um, major issues in terms of HIV AIDS and particularly African Americans. Um, as of 2007, CDC uh, announced that there are over a million AIDS cases um, that have been reported in the United States and actually AIDS cases have been decreasing um, in the U.S. between 2003 and 2007. However, when you take a look at the cumulative number of HIV AIDS cases and proportions of AIDS cases by race and ethnicity from the very beginning of the epidemic through 2006, you see a really distinct pattern. Um, from the very beginning of the epidemic, the proportion of HIV or rather AIDS cases was highest among whites um, and, and lowest among Asian Americans with blacks somewhat in the middle. Um, by about 1994, though, that had changed um, and that the proportion of AIDS cases that were being diagnosed in the country from 1994 through now are primarily among African Americans. 
in terms of lifetime risk of an HIV diagnosis, um, there's some data that CDC released between 2004 and 2005 that really tried to take a look at lifetime risk by race and ethnicity. And they found that African Americans among black men, they had a one in 16 chance of being diagnosed with HIV in their lifetime. Compared with black women, they had a one in 30 chance of being diagnosed with HIV in their lifetime. Among Latina men, Latino men, they had a one in 35 chance of being diagnosed with HIV in their lifetime. And for Latinas, a one in 114 chance of being diagnosed in their lifetime. And then when you took a look at whites, there were one in 104 men who might be diagnosed in their lifetime among white men. And for white women, one in 588 who had a chance of being diagnosed with HIV. So you could see fairly clearly from some of those numbers that there's a disproportionate burden among communities of color, even though we represent proportionally a smaller part of the population in the United States. In terms of some of the HIV AIDS diagnoses that have been taking place, um, there's actually been increases among all subgroups of HIV AIDS diagnoses. Uh, we've seen an increase of 26% among men who have sex with men. Um, there's been an increase about 9% for heterosexual males and 14% for heterosexual females. And there have been increases across all races and ethnicities in HIV and AIDS diagnoses over the last several years. Now, one of the things that people keep talking about is that the reason that we see so many high cases among African Americans as well as other communities of color is that there must be something that they're doing wrong. Um, you know, we all know that you get HIV from unprotected sex. You get HIV as well from shared needles and drug use, number of sex partners. But one thing that's become very clear in the research over the last five years, even 10 years, is that there's not a one-to-one -one correlation with the type of behavior that you engage in and your risk for becoming infected with HIV. And you see that really clearly in the data with communities of color where you see people who engage in relatively little risk um, from African American women as well as gay black men compared to other communities. But we're still far more likely to become infected with HIV. And there are several factors that are associated with that. Uh, the first factor is sexually transmitted diseases. We know that if you have a sexually transmitted disease, um, you are three to five times more likely to contract HIV if you're HIV negative. And if you're HIV positive and you also have an, as another sexually transmitted disease, you're more likely to transmit HIV to a partner who's negative per act of unprotected sex. And we also know that in terms of the African American community, the CDC data are very clear that the prevalence of STDs are fairly high in the black community compared to other communities. And you see those statistics year after year that are being supported and reported by CDC. Another factor is unrecognized HIV infection. Uh, we know from the data that there are about 20% of Americans who don't know their HIV status. They're HIV positive and they don't realize it. And that 20% is responsible to as many as 55 to 60% of new HIV transmissions each year. Now, that 20% isn't distributed equally by race and ethnicity. Um, African Americans, by far, are less likely to know their HIV status compared to other populations. And if you don't know your HIV status, as I just mentioned, you're more likely to transmit HIV to someone else within your community. So that's another issue is why we're seeing some of the disparities among African Americans. Another one is limited access to care. Um, it's very clear, I'm sure you've already heard during this conference, uh, that African Americans have limited access to care compared to other communities. And there are life-saving drugs that we have out there for people living with HIV to allow people to live longer, but also to reduce HIV transmissibility. If you don't have access to those drugs and you have a higher viral load, uh, you're more likely to transmit HIV compared to somebody who's taking those drugs. And in the African American community, we don't have as much access to those drugs for various reasons. And last, and perhaps one of the biggest factors that we see for why we see these disparate rates of HIV in the black community is the greater prevalence of HIV within our community. Um, we're starting from a baseline that's qualitatively different than other communities. Uh, there are some communities where people engage in untold amounts of risk, number of partners, the amount of unprotected sex that they take place in. But since their HIV prevalence in their community is so low, they have a lower likelihood of coming into contact with somebody who's HIV positive. In the black community, there's really no room for error. Um, the community prevalence is so high in our community that even if you engage in very little risk, you are far more likely to become infected compared to people in other communities where the viral load as well as the community load is, is fairly low. 
So that's one of the major issues that I really wanted to discuss a little bit today is trying to move away from individual risk behavior and blaming the victim. Um, when people take a look at these statistics, they might say, well, what's going on in communities of color? What's wrong with communities of color? And that's not the case. The case is that there are other forces at work um, beyond individual risk behavior, that there's a context that places African Americans and Latinos at greater risk compared to other populations. And that context needs to be addressed in order for us to really address the epidemic effectively in the United States. I'll leave my comments to that. One of the, the great things about uh, following Greg is that as he spoke, I just eliminated uh, slides from my PowerPoint projection to, to, to be more efficient. Uh, one of the other good things is that I'm not a scientist, and so you know, Greg uh, can give you the data, and I see my job as giving you uh, the soundbite. Uh, so I want to thank NABJ for doing this and your continued uh, commitment to this, and, and of course our longtime partner, uh, Kaiser Family Foundation. And so I'll begin with you know, the first soundbite. And, and those of you who've heard me speak before, have heard me say it before, you know, AIDS in America today is a black disease. People don't like it when I say that. No, no, white folks get offended because they're worried about distribution of the resources to fight the disease. Black folks get offended because they think that it's further stigmatization. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Uh, and, and when you look at a disease where we are 50 percent, roughly 50 percent of the new cases in this country are black, 50% of people who are living with HIV roughly are black, and we're roughly 50% of the annual AIDS deaths. What is it if it's not a black disease? And if we fail in black America, we fail, period, full stop. Uh, and when the secretary said that when our foot was off the pedal, you know, our people were suffering, we should be clear on who our people are when we're talking about that. You know, that the domestic, a the domestic epidemic is primarily about black people. And so when we have an epidemic out of control here in this, con in this country, it is primarily about us. And that's the new story that, that is absolutely imperative that you all keep reporting. Now, I think of it as kind of a tales of two cities uh, uh, on a whole bunch of ways. You know, this is a health disparities conference. So when you look at the AIDS epidemic through the lens of, of health disparities, you see uh, a tale of two cities. You see one epidemic that is on a downward trend and flat. You know, that in, in, in most populations, uh, what we have is over the last few years uh, an experience of a downward trend that then flattened out with the exception of white gay men. In black communities, what we have is an upward trend that still is flattening out, but it's, a upward, it's on an upward trajectory and flattening out. Uh, so to the degree that we have a widening health disparities around HIV and AIDS. One of the points that I think is really important to touch on is, is, is the notion around why are we here, and, 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 and Greg touched on some of the social determinants uh, about why we are here relative to the disparities. And I think some of our, the other colleagues will, will speak to that. But one of the, one of the issues around why we are, are here you know, it really has to be around the nature of the response. No, we were slow to take ownership of the AIDS epidemic, and I think we still are not completely there. Uh, and unless and until we take ownership of the epidemic, we have no ability to turn the ship around in that regard. And so, so that's the bad news. Now, the good news is that while we're not where we need to be, we're not where we used to be. Now, and there have been a tremendous amount of changes, and certainly uh, the messages from the Black AIDS Institute over the last two years have dramatically changed. And many of you know that for the longest time, what you were getting from us, at least, was the doom and gloom. No, we were the folks that were running around and said, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky, the sky is falling. And actually, we, we should have said, not that it's falling, but it has fallen, because that's actually what has happened uh, on, on, on us. Uh, but uh, where we changed our, our message is in a number of ways. One is that you know, in our communities, we have moved. We have activated. A lot of that has been driven by black journalists, you know, that, that, that you have certainly been the heroes. Now, and when I first started talking to black journalists, there was, there was a conversation about why should we take on this issue. And now, 
it is, you know, now as I said to someone earlier, they're trying to kill a brother. I mean, it is really difficult to keep up with the requests that we get. So clearly, uh, you all want to write about this, and, 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 and that is fantastic. And maybe we can help you make it easier in your newsrooms to talk about the new stories and the stories that are out there. And I think that what is exciting, even in, the, in an arena of where it bleeds, it leads, that there are affirming stories to talk about. We have had dramatic changes with uh, the response in black communities. Three years ago, not a single major national black institution in America had a national plan to address HIV and AIDS. Uh, today, almost every major national black institution at least has a strategic action plan. Okay. Three years ago, hardly anybody had someone where the buck stopped with them in these national organizations. Today, 14 of the, the, the largest national black institutions all have a national AIDS coordinator. Uh, today, you know, it is difficult to open a black newspaper or a black website you know, where HIV is not addressed in some way. You know, uh, we've, we've delivered the message to our leaders, from political leaders to media organizations, to civil rights organizations, to health leaders, to businesses, to faith organizations. You need to begin to address HIV and AIDS. Now, in churches all over black America, it is still uneven. No, but we have seen progress. There have been a number of very, very important faith leaders now that have changed their position on HIV and AIDS. We also are looking at, you know, in April of, of last year, the, the, the White House and the CDC launched the first ever uh, 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 social marketing, not first ever, but the first in, I think, 20 years social marketing campaign uh, on the domestic front. Uh, around that same time, uh, the Black Ace Institute and the Kaiser Family uh, Foundation, in partnership with the CDC, launched uh, the first ever uh, social marketing campaign targeting African Americans. And the response of that camp campaign uh, has been absolutely uh, remarkable. And the key to that campaign is an aspirational message. Now, it speaks to the fact that as black people, uh, we have gone through a lot and survived. No, we were greater than the Middle Passage. No, we were greater than slavery. We were greater than Reconstruction. We were greater than Jim Crow. We were greater than the violence of the 60s. And I may be the only one on this panel that can say it, and people get upset when I say it, but we were greater than George W. Bush as well. Okay? And so we will be greater than AIDS uh, as well. And that's the message of the campaign. No, and, and it echoes uh, a speech that then-Senator Obama made around HIV and AIDS, where he said that when we come together, uh, we may not be able to solve everything, but we are greater than many of the challenges uh, before us. Uh, and the thing about the social marketing campaign uh, that I think is important is that it speaks around building a national movement to respond to the AIDS epidemic. And if you look at how we've addressed challenges in our community over time, it is about us coming together on the same page. Uh, and that's what it will take to move this epidemic, and, and, and we believe the social marketing campaign gets us there. Uh, and if we can roll the tape, and then I'll shut up and we'll uh, can go on to other panelists to give you an idea of what we're talking about, about good news. Okay. So while we're, while we're setting up story ideas. Um, okay. Today in America, African Americans are more impacted by HIV than any other racial ethnic group. And yet, we're nearly 50% of the estimated 1.2 million Americans living with HIV. People of color and African American women particularly are affected by this crisis to a much greater degree. The HIV epidemic has fallen off the radar screen in our country at exactly the time when our friends at the CDC have told us that it is a much larger epidemic than we thought it was. HIV is a big deal. If we don't do something very soon, uh, the disease will be so endemic in the community that there really won't be much to do. It really takes people deciding 
that enough, you know, that enough is enough. This is not about somebody else. This is about us. This is about life and death for so many people. This is about uh, making sure that people live long lives. HIV is really something that we have not embraced as a community and got behind and tackled. We fought so hard, generation to generation, trying to change things for the better. And this is how we go out. To HIV and AIDS? No. Nah. <laughs> no, that's not our faith. That's not how we go out. Because we're greater than that. I know we're greater than that. We're greater than AIDS. <laughs> this Greater Than campaign puts it in perspective and reminds us this is something we can deal with, this is something that we can address, this is something that we are greater than. It's about a message of affirmation, and that's why greater than AIDS is really important because I am greater than AIDS. The history of black people in America is laced with, uh, with, with pain and challenges, but it's also laced with, you know, gargantuan triumphs. And it begins with knowledge. Because knowledge is greater than, greater, greater than ignorance. The media can play an absolutely critical role and save lives, especially when it comes to reaching young people. As the leading publication for African American women, it is our responsibility to have this conversation each and every month with the 8 million women that we reach and encourage them to take control of their health. I get myself tested regularly to protect my future because knowing is greater than doubt. It's about loving yourself first. We have to really take control over our health instead of our health taking control over us. And if you love yourself, you will insist on your partner getting tested and you will insist that you get tested as well. One test, one million people, that's the goal. I am one in a million. I am one in a million. You be one. Get tested. So I check myself and protect myself. Because knowing is greater than doubt. I talk openly with my granddaughter. I talk with my boyfriend about getting tested. I talk with friends about my status. Communities can play a very strong role in tackling stigma, discrimination, homophobia. The world becomes smaller when we communicate. I talk about it quite a bit because honestly, I lost both of my parents to HIV and AIDS. So anytime I'm in a group of people and something like this comes up and dealing with health, HIV and AIDS is always the first thing that I bring up. We could perhaps help some other families understand and deal with this thing, not to run from it and hide from it, you know, but to, to embrace it and find out how, what could, what could you do? So I volunteer in my neighborhood. I organize workshops at my church. Because action is greater than apathy. There is the potential for a fresh start and for fresh thinking on our domestic epidemic. I'm confident that we're gonna see the political will uh, from the Congress and uh, the White House now uh, magnified. We can end this thing. It just requires each and every one of us doing our part. It's our time now. It's our time to take responsibility and say we're going to do something about this. You can be sure we're greater than AIDS, and you can count me in. Count me in. And me. And me. And me. Together we can do this. We've done it before. We can do it again. Because we are greater than AIDS. So I'll wrap with four story ideas. One, uh, treatment as prevention. Uh, Greg talked about health disparity access to treatment. And while there certainly is an important story there for individuals leaving, living with HIV and AIDS, no, but the other story is by reducing individual viral load, by reducing community level viral burden, we actually have an impact on prevention. Uh, so that's the story that's worth pursuing. Stop pathologizing communities. Uh, I think that, that to, to acknowledge that, that, that black communities are moving, uh, the story about what traditional black institutions 
actually are doing, uh, that's an important story. Uh, th that to, to break through the silos, we had a, a, a session earlier on health care reform. There's a huge age story in that health care reform conversation. Okay, if we make health care reform happen, we dramatically change. You know, it's a game changer for HIV and AIDS. So that's a storyline. Uh, uh, the White House is working on a national AIDS strategy. We need to talk about that story and, and how that's going to impact black communities, particularly more so than any other community. Uh, uh, I think that's an important story. We, the, the CDC has new guidelines about routinization of HIV testing. How is that being implemented in communities, and how is that being linked to link to care. Now, there's a big push on testing, but testing, a, t a test in of itself is not a prevention mechanism, is not a treatment mechanism. We need to be talking about testing. We need to be talking about how routinized testing is being implemented and how people are being linked to care. Uh, we need to talk about clinical trials. Now, the, no, the, 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 there have been dramatic changes in HIV treatment and where people get access, the first access to that is in a clinical trial, and we need to make sure that black folks are engaged uh, in, in, in that phase uh, of the epidemic. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. LaShawn McKeever. I'm with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, and I'm currently conducting health policy research on HIV and AIDS for the foundation. Um, I'd like to thank the National Association of Black Journalists for inviting me here this morning to talk with you about the work that I'm doing. And um, if Phil thought he was in a great position, I'm in an even better position. I'm down from three pages to one, so I'll be very brief. <laughs> um, but I, I, there are a few points that I think are absolutely critical for you as journalists to um, hear more about as this um, as it relates to this issue. Um, just to give you an idea of some of the, the things that the foundation is doing to address HIV and AIDS, we are participating in um, the initiative that um, Phil made reference to, the Act Against AIDS Leadership Initiative. We are one of the 14 um, traditional African-American institutions that are addressing this um, issue. In addition, we have several fellowship and internship programs, and several of our fellows and interns have done specific projects around HIV and AIDS. And then um, the, the fellowship that I'm in was especially created for the Center for Policy Analysis and Research, and so I'm looking at how we can um, shape policy around HIV and AIDS for the African-American community. Um, so if I were to say two things that I think are critical, well, th there's three actually, three things. The first one is, it's a simple statement. HIV and AIDS is an epidemic in the African-American community. And I think that people have um, lost focus of what that word means. An epidemic is a very serious, it's a very serious situation. Um, it's defined as something that is spreading rapidly and extensive by infection and affecting many individuals of a population at the same time. Now, um, I know for the last couple of months, none of us could turn on our televisions without seeing something about the H1N1 virus and all of the things around that. Well, that type of energy, that type of focus, we have to keep that level of intensity in addressing the HIV and AIDS epidemic in our country. Um, the, in terms of the research that I've done, I've spent the last year talking with people, whether it's from people that um, work with health service organizations, people who are living with AIDS, um, people from governmental organizations, and also looking at the research around this. I'm a relative newcomer to this particular field. I've done a lot of work in health disparities around diabetes and um, obesity, but this, this topic, I really wanted to see what was happening with this issue in our community. And through the conversations and the, the information that I've taken away from it, we have a huge, um, knowledge gap in terms of people really understanding what is happening to people that live next door to us, people that we work with. Just by show of hands, how many of you in this room know someone that has HIV and AIDS or knows someone who has, you know? Okay, so for those that don't have your hands raised, guess what? You probably do know someone that's living with HIV and AIDS and they just haven't been diagnosed yet. So we have a very serious epidemic that is here in our community that we have to address. Um, the second point that I wanted to uh, um, speak to was something that Phil had mentioned about um, prevention. He talked about treatment and different 
levels and avenues of prevention. And um, through the research that I've been doing, one of the key focus or the key focus of my recommendation for the Congressional Black Caucus is that we have to start looking through a true preventive um, framework at this issue. And so most people look at prevention as a one-dimensional action. Um, but prevention is actually divided into three, three categories. There's primary prevention, secondary, and tertiary prevention. And so under primary uh, prevention, we're taking a look at what actions can we do to prevent the disease in people that are not currently infected. Secondary prevention is how do we identify um, the disease early enough in its natural history so that we can treat people with available interventions um, that would be more effective if they're treated earlier. And thirdly, tertiary prevention, um, their efforts to decrease the morbidity and mortality of those that are currently living with the disease. And so if you were to really look at what we need to do from a policy perspective as it relates to HIV and AIDS, we really need to focus on prevention in its true sense. One, primary prevention, we have to educate. We have to educate. You know, no matter who the teacher is, whether we're encouraging, you know, the parents to talk to the kids, the school systems, our leaders, the media, we have to educate because the reality is if you were to go out and just, and I, I actually, you know, challenge you to go out into random um, places and ask people questions about HIV and AIDS. A lot of people don't they don't really know what the disease is. They don't really know it's a problem in, in black America. And they don't really understand some of the true issues behind what's driving this epidemic in our community. Secondly, um, not just with um, the education piece, but we also have to continue to fund research that can help us find um, innovative ways to educate and to prevent this disease in our community. And then under the secondary um, prevention umbrella or tier, um, as Phil had mentioned before, routine testing. We have, people need to know their status. You can go years and years, um, up to like eight, eight to ten years being um, infected and not know that you're infected. And imagine if you're, di if you're infected with HIV and AIDS at 16. How many boyfriends and girlfriends do you think a 16-year-old would go through in that, that course of time? Or even adults, older adults. There's just so many issues surrounding that. So um, routine testing is key to decreasing the risk of the spread of this disease and helping to slow the progression of the disease. Um, treatment works. And treatment is a part of um, prevention. And so that's the, the third point also that Phil had mentioned. Um, treatment is prevention. When you can slow the progression of HIV to developing full-blown AIDS, you're preventing someone from developing a more serious consequence related to the disease. And so that, that's something that I really think is important for journalists to consider. When you hear people talking about prevention, that it, it and you're thinking about, um, or as uh, health policy makers are working around this issue, we have to look at it from a, a true prevention framework. And then my final thought, um, when I was called by the organizers of the conference, she asked me, I said, well, what would you like for me to speak on? You know, there's so many different things I can speak on. She said, well, what's on your mind? And the first thing that came to my mind was what is happening in the South. I think that um, we have to elevate the issue of what's happening to um, African Americans that are living in the South. Af um, I've talked to several colleagues over the last year that are working in the trenches trying to, you know, grapple with this huge epidemic, true epidemic of what we're seeing. And I liken it unto, um, as a doctor, you know, when I sit next to the bedside of a patient in intensive care, at some point you see that the patient's not doing well, and at some point you're going to have to make the call of pulling the plug. And a lot of the, my colleagues are, are very concerned with, with how funding is going and how all of these, um, you know, different things are happening so rapidly. And um, that is the epicenter, in my opinion. And also, research is showing that the South, the numbers are growing so rapidly in the South. And we, we need to address that. Um, and I, I think that's it. So I'll be ready to answer questions. <laughs> Okay, technology and me. Uh, my name is Vanessa Johnson and I bring you greetings from Frank J. Oldham Jr., the Board of Trustees, which Dr. Downer is one, uh, and the staff of the National Association of People with AIDS. 
You know, it never amazes, it never ceases to amaze me how nervous I still get, even though I've told my story many mm -hmm. times to many people in different audiences. Mm -hmm. And when I tell my colleagues and peers who um, shy away from telling their story because they too get nervous, I tell them that just means that you're alive mm -hmm. and that you can feel, mm -hmm. which is a good thing, because for a long time I was numb. Um, but I'm honored to be among this panel of distinguished individuals and members of the National Society of Black Journalists, Kaiser F Family Foundation, and uh, you in the audience. Napa was founded in 1983 and we represent and advocate for people living with HIV AIDS in the United States. With the advancements in care and treatment, we are expected to live a long time and we're expected to live longer and better lives. And some would even think that now life is normal for a person living with HIV AIDS. Unfortunately, this is not true. Yes, we have come a long way, but we are not where we need to be. Premature death from AIDS-related conditions is at all-time high among people of color, particularly people of African descent living with HIV AIDS. So how do we break through this? How do we, as you said earlier, get our foot back on the pedal, or the moderator before you said that? I would tell you that we do this by telling our stories. I've been a person living with HIV AIDS for over 20 years, and it was a woman, a black woman, who saved my life. When I was telling you that I was numb, it was she who said that you need to stop. Think about what it is you're doing and what it is you think you want to do with your life because you can live with this disease. And it was those empowering words that enabled me to be here today, and that was 20 years ago. Because at the end of graduate school, law school, I thought my life was over. That was not the graduating present that I wanted to have. I was going to go down south. <laughs> and be a lawyer and advocate for other people who uh, needed advocacy. And instead, I had to learn how to do that for myself, which is a powerful lesson in and of itself because a lot of times we look beyond ourselves and think it's other people who need help when it really is ourselves that need the help. So I encourage other people like myself to tell their stories. We do that through a number of programs at the National Association of People with AIDS. I'm now able to do that with Phil and his group Black AIDS Institute through their newsletter. Please take a look at that newsletter. I'm on there the third week of every month talking about disclosure, if you don't mind me saying that. Because disclosure is a very powerful thing for people living with HIV AIDS. And I really encourage people to disclose when possible and to share their stories. And I say that, and my take home message is that our stories can save lives. Our stories save lives because we talk about self-care and what it's like to live with HIV AIDS, the medications we have to take, the number of doctors that we have to see. Uh, it is a long process, and I think that that will go a long ways to disrupting the myth that HIV AIDS is, a, is an easy disease to live with. It's, it's not insurmountable, but you have to do a lot of things to ensure that you're going you're gonna to be here. Uh, the other thing that we can do is advocacy. Part of that save is advocacy and making sure that our communities get the resources we need. And we can go up there with you on the Hill, go up there with Phil and Greg and everyone else to tell our story so that we put a face to the, to the disease. And then we can have victory over stigma. Mm -hmm. Stigma is one of the largest issues in our community. We are definitely afraid of this illness. And it reminds me of a metaphor I said of a disease that came into a community and many people died. And they said, why did so many people die? Was it because of disease? And they said, no, it's because of fear. Mm -hmm. It is fear that's killing our community. And then empowering. We do that through leadership development. And I offer to you through the programs that we offer, the Common Threads is one of them, that we have a number of people around the country who are willing and able to tell the story. So if you're looking for people to share their stories about HIV AIDS, you can contact me or you can contact Phil and uh, he will get in touch with us at the National Association of People with AIDS. I encourage all of us living with, affected by, or anyone who just cares to hear our stories, let us use the power of our stories to save lives. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Golda Downer with the National Minority AIDS Education and Training Center in the College of Medicine at Howard University. We have provided 10 years of unbroken service 
to the community with respect to HIV and AIDS. And during that time, I've trained over 39,000 clinicians providing culturally competent clinical care to our community. I want to give you f just four scenarios from some of the studies that we've done and what we found. As Vanessa just said, stigma is a major driving force. Our focus is on clinicians. The idea is if the clinicians get it, then the patients get the best care. And that's what we're mandated to do. What if I told you that we've done studies and found that 40% of our own clinicians self-reported some form of stigma in providing care within our community. Stigma is the permanent scarring or lynching of a person's identity. And when it's done in the context of care, it's a death sentence. If we don't get tested, nobody gets treated, care is not provided. And this stigma, again, self-reported, Substance abuse history, sexual practices, and sexual orientation. If you're presented with any of that, the clinicians told us, chances are they may not give you an HIV test, and they may not get you into care. Who do we hold responsible for what goes on in our community? I think behaviors are important, but not just the behaviors of individuals, but those of us who have been put in a place to provide care. Someone has to care. I'm coming from my practice. I just saw three patients before I came here, and I told them where I was coming. I said, what one thing would you want me to tell the group if I speak to them on your behalf? One person said it. Tell them to tell the physicians not to stand afar off when they talk to me. I think Jeff Crowley said it last week, observational care. That's in our community. We are still people of color. And so the patient community that feels the stigma, physicians do the same thing. Nurses do the same thing. We had a student graduating recently, a resident. We talked about, uh, we had a care day and patients were positive. Somebody brought cookies and she said, you expect me to eat those HIV cookies? This is somebody going into our community to provide care. We looked at the CDC recommendations. Everyone between 16 and 63 should be tested. And we asked some of the clinicians, and you know what they said to us, 39%? We don't know about those guidelines, those recommendations. What are they? Not only that, 17% of those who were actually reported knowing about them said we didn't practice that, we didn't do that. I'm saying to everybody here, and this is my dilemma, the leaders of NABJ, how do we tell our stories so that it's done in the context of improving care and not vilifying the community? That's my challenge. Because this is something, and what these individuals are saying is, we need help. That's what they're saying. I don't know how to do this. I need help. In Washington, D.C., and I chair the Mayor's Health Coordinating Council for the district, so I know about our state health plan, 63% of patients in care who were diagnosed positive, converted to AIDS within a year after being tested. Did you hear what I said? They were in care. That means the clinicians were not aware of the manifestations of this disease, such that when they presented with them, they didn't think anything of it. Our clinicians must be trained. We also looked at who were the clinicians who were doing this, who needed more care, and I'm not saying anything if you've graduated 10 years ago, I don't mean you. <laughs> but we found that the ones who are 10 years or older, again, especially depending on where you practice, if you're not forced to keep up with the, practice, the good practice measures, if you're in a hospital, chances you are, because you have to be forced to keep up. But private practice, community health centers, we looked at several places to find out were these some of the driving forces? These are some of the ugly truths. As my father says, the price one pays for any profession or calling is the intimate knowledge of its ugly side. I'm sharing some of that ugly side with you today. But how do we correct this? How do we correct this? Telling part of the story is one thing, but I think anybody is remiss if when you tell the story, you do not say, how do we resolve this? As Phil talked about the numbers, and my colleague at N talked about the numbers as well, what does it mean for us? 
Ten years from now, do we hear the same figures? What are we doing? We must not, and I'm saying this again, we must not look for pockets within our community. At one time it was African-American MSMs, then it was black women. We are a community, and if we keep looking at those pockets and diversifying, before you know it, you're putting money here, and then over here we don't know what's going on, and we come over here, we have to get as a group. We have to sit as a group, and care must be culturally competent. If it's MSM, what are your issues? If it's black women or older, what are your issues? If it's teenagers, what are your issues? We have to come as a community and provide care as clinicians in that practice setting. I'm going to tell you a quick story. There was a rat in a barn, and the farmer put on a rat trap. And the rat went to the chicken and said, my God, come quick, there's a rat trap. And he said, that has nothing to do with me. And then he went to the pig, he said, come, come, help me. There's a rat trap in the barn. The pig said, that has nothing to do with me. And he went to the cow, he said, please. And the cow said, it had nothing to do with me. Then they heard the farmer's wife scream. The rat trap had caught, the rat trap had caught a, a snake, and it bit her. And the farmer came and said, oh my gosh, let me make you some chicken soup. <laughs> <laughs> and then... The, the, she didn't get better. So the people in the community came and said, oh, let's slaughter the pig because we're going to have breakfast in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then she died and they killed the cow. What did the rat trap, rat trap have to do with everybody? You get it? Mm -hmm. That rat trap, all of us. And that's what AIDS is in our community. I want to make sure that um, we all have an opportunity for people to ask questions, but um, there are a couple that I want to ask very quickly before we open it up. And one is that um, we know that HIV and AIDS is um, a, a top leading cause of death for women of color of childbearing age. That's a story, that's a, that's a statistic that a lot of people know about. But do you have any suggestions of different ways that we can frame that story still with impact so that women can get this message? And, I, and I'm really, I, I know that this um, epidemic affects our community as a whole, but this group I'm particularly concerned about because a lot of these women are mothers and they are. Um, just that age group is so important um, because of their at childbearing age. So can you talk about suggestions for us for framing stories with impact that can make a difference? I think one of the things when I speak to mothers, and especially what Brian said a while ago is important. If you can't get transportation to come out of your community, then you're actually, the sexual network is there. You can't leave. But what I say to mothers and even fathers, to and mothers like that is who takes your name into the next generation? Who cares for your children? Who tells them where you come from? It's really difficult because especially this being Girl and Women's Month, and um, the, sorry, uh, Women's Health Month, and the, on the 10th will be Girl and Women's Health Day, you ask what are some of the driving forces and how can we protect ourselves? Especially because many of us are at risk for coercive sex and for rape, something we don't talk a lot about. But saying the message, love yourself, is sometimes not enough. It's not enough. As a patient said to me, when I don't have any food to eat, you can't tell me to take my medicine. I'm not taking it. You know what I mean? Because it makes me sick. So what message do you give young girls or women who have childbearing age? And I think the one thing I say to the women I see is, do you want a healthy child? How do you protect your baby? And if you're not around, how do you do it? And the one thing that they'll say to me is, I'll move away from here. I move away from the environment I'm in, but the message I'd craft if I were writing a story is I'd say to the women of childbearing age, if you don't take care of yourself, you are the mother earth, and the child that you bring is what sustains our environment, you have to, have to do this. Find somebody to help you and get this done. I think another spin on the story, you know, the, the, the House just passed the jobs bill, uh, and we're talking about jobs, is to look at what are the economic engines in our community. The truth of the matter is, for a lot of reasons that we all know about, you now women and young women, particularly women between the ages of 24 and 44, they're the economic engines of, of, of our communities. Those are the people who are employed you know, because of what's happening uh, with black men. So that's, an, that's another spin on that particular story. Uh, so if, if that population is being decimated by, by HIV and AIDS, now that's going to continue the urban blight that's happening in our communities. 
I think we also need to address some of the structural factors and some of the structural issues as to what's putting black women in particular at risk for HIV infection. And there's a couple. Um, when you take a look at the incredible incarceration rates that are taking place among African American men, and we already know from various data that black men are more likely to choose black women as partners. Black women are more likely to choose black men as partners. When you have an awful lot of black men who are already taken out of the population, it disrupts the ratio of black men and black women. So it makes it easier if there's a black man who's HIV positive to have multiple partners who are black women. And that increases HIV transmission risk. And we need more of that story being told about how some of these structural issues also affect why black women are at risk for HIV infection. Another issue that I think we should talk about as well is um, really just who are we choosing as partners, and particularly who are black women in partnerships with. Phil was talking about economic issues, uh, but we do know that there are quite a few black women who choose younger women, who choose older partners, for various reasons. And the problem with choosing older partners is that that's where a lot of the HIV cases are. If you're going to look for the greatest prevalence of HIV, it's going to be people who are older than you if you're a young adult. So those black women who have older partners are more likely to seroconvert with HIV than those women who choose partners of the same age or have an opportunity to choose partners of the same age. So even getting out those simple messages is something that helps. And it's really jarring when you take a look at the research data. There was a study that was just published two years ago that looked at pregnant black women between the ages of 15 and 17. And the mean age of their male partners who got them pregnant was 26. That is an issue that has got to be addressed if we're going to address HIV in young black women. Um, I just wanted to um, add some, a few additional points. Um, I think it's very important, uh, or another spin to that story is, when you get people to think about it in the context of a generational span, right now people sort of look at it as, you know, uh, as um, someone was saying before about how the, it's this group or that group. But really now we have whole generations that are, that are um, at risk. S um, older adults slash senior citizens, um, we have to pay attention to what's happening in that group as well. So you have the potential for framing a story where you take a look at an older adult, someone of a childbearing age, and then a younger person. Um, research has shown that the sexual debut of, uh, of adolescents is getting earlier and earlier. So you have literally three generations that are at risk of developing the disease at the same time. Mm. So I think that could be a potential spin on how to um, bring in the discussion of women. And when you start to talk about the family in that framework, and when people say, you know, wow, my daughter actually or my son is actually at risk of developing this disease, and my goodness, you know, my grandmother or my mother, you know, and it, it, it promotes a, a, an atmosphere where you really have to talk talk about it as an entire family unit. Okay. Uh, one next question. It is a, a generational type of question. And um, I'm concerned about the numbers among younger black people, particularly because this is a generation that wasn't even born when all of the hysteria and all of the all of the fear that was going on, like when I was in high school and they called us into the cafeteria and said, don't have sex because you will die and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, which I don't think was the best message anyway. But um, but they, this generation wasn't around to see how Im important and, and, and just the devastation that was going on early in the epidemic. They, they see it as a chronic manageable disease, which um, I think probably has problems in, in, uh, in and of itself. But with that being said, young black people are, their infection rates are, um, I think it's from the ages of 13 to 29, young black people are um, almost half of the new infection rates. But then inside of that, um, young black, gay, and bisexual men constitute a large number of that. So, I mean, when I'm seeing these messages to young black people, I don't see these messages being crafted to young black gay men. And I'm wondering, do we still have some homophobia around this disease that we need to address as a community? Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 you know, your, your issue around the impact uh, on, 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 on young 
black adults relative to, to new infections is actually worse than, than the, stat, the statistic that you quoted, that um, uh, in that age range, we're roughly 70 percent of the new cases in that age range. So it is, it is much worse. And then among young MSMs, uh, we certainly have uh, huge challenges. And part of it is homophobia and the stigma associated with it. Uh, part of it is that uh, there, there's become, um, it, it's, it, that when, 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 we, when we backed away of doing sex education, HIV education in the schools, there's actually now a whole generation that actually did not even get, you know, called into the cafeteria and told anything. They've not, they're not getting anything at all. Uh, and so to the degree they think that they think about HIV at all, uh, they think about it as something in a historical perspective, that it's something that happened then rather than something that, that needs to happen, now, that, that is happening now. And, and that, that, so there's a strange paradigm. So at the same time that they are disproportionately impacted, you know, they are dis disproportionately unaware of either uh, the, 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 the facts around HIV and AIDS or, or concerned about those, those facts. And so that is certainly an important story that needs to be told. I wanted to share three things. Thanks, Phil. In terms of self-exploration, I had to, when I was diagnosed with HIV, I had to deal with my own homophobia. And people who come into this field or people who are diagnosed with HIV, that is one of the things that they have to confront. Because if in our community, HIV AIDS is equated with gay men. It's just a fact of life still today. Most people say, I'm not gay. I don't have anything to worry about. But for me, that was one of the reasons why I thought I had nothing to fear. I had no, no reason to be concerned about HIV AIDS. And when I really flipped that upside down, it meant that I really didn't care. I didn't care that the next person who might be a man, gay man, had HIV, because it wasn't me. And when I had to look at that and I decided to do advocacy, I realized I had to do advocacy on behalf of the entire community, yes. not just because I'm a black woman, not just because I'm a female, but everyone who could be possibly impacted by this disease. Doesn't mean I don't have a special interest in my community, but I have to make sure that my message is consistent, that anybody who's alive and living needs to be cared for. The second thing I would say in terms of um, young people is I use a little technique when I do presentations, and it's called the sucker trick. <laughs> And what they do is uh, you have to make sure they're not sitting next to a family member, and you have to make sure they're not sitting next to anyone they're intimate with. And what we do is we pass around these beautiful suckers, and then after a while we ask people how they're doing, and they say, yo, this is real good. And then we say, take it out of your mouth and give it to the next person. And their reaction is astounding because you're like, but that's exactly what you do when you go out on that date and you decide you're going to have sex with somebody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I encourage you all to, <laughs> I encourage you, <laughs> that's right, I encourage you all to use that one, okay? That's it. Okay, let's open up to questions. Any questions out there? Yes, just a point of information. Uh, why is the South now the epicenter? It's by virtue of, of the composition. You have more African Americans living in the South. And so since the epidemic is focused in the African American community, you have more um, African Americans that are living in Southern states. Let me just add to that. Not only do we have the number of African Americans living there, but if you look to see where access to care is, especially in some of those geographically remote areas, that's a major problem. And something we have not addressed in a very tangible and, and really intentional manner is that we have in this country, because of work, clinical workforce challenges, we have a lot of foreign trained clinicians here. You hear my accent, but I was trained here. And with HIV, when you travel internationally and you realize that people come, each of us comes, and even if you're not overseas, come with your own prejudices. Many of these foreign trained clinicians are put in geographical remote areas, on reservations in the deep south and in urban areas. And if they bring their own kind of prejudice and stigma to HIV, it's going to continue to mushroom. 
One of the things that the National Minority AIDS Education and Training Center has done is we've developed focused, culturally competent clinical training for foreign trained clinicians. And again as well, we have the very first and this year it will be our second time, the National Clinicians HIV AIDS Testing and Awareness Day. That National, AIDS Clini National Clinicians HIV AIDS Testing and Awareness Day, I, we feel is a cog in the center of all the testing days because everybody has to be linked to care. And that is an opportunity for all clinicians who are not comfortable about testing, who needs to be educated about HIV and testing so they can learn how to do it and do it well. A linkage, if you will. To the community. And then two other reasons are poverty as a social determiner uh, and the age population in the community, that the, the, the median age in the southeast region of the country is younger uh, than other parts of the country. And why the age issue is so big is that STDs are disproportionately higher among younger populations than others. And as we mentioned before, you're at greater risk for HIV infection if you have STDs. But I also don't think that we need to um, ignore the fact that HIV is also an issue in many other parts of the country. I moved from New York City down to North Carolina, and I was amazed to see in North Carolina, specifically in rural North Carolina, um, young black women and young black gay men who were seroconverting at ages 15 years of age and younger. Um, and it was the same exact issues that I saw in the South Bronx in New York City. So we can't ignore the fact that some of these dynamics are dynamics that we're seeing all over the place geographically. Hello, my name is Rona Brown. I'm an advocate um, for sickle cell. And I, I know that the American Red Cross does a lot of testing for blood in the blood. And, um, but I have a hard time convincing young people as well as older people um, to do the transfusions or the phoresis because they're afraid that they are going to get AIDS from the blood. Mm -hmm. So I'm just asking you as professionals and experts, what would you say to a person whose life can dramatically, drastically be changed due to a choice that they make of either to take the blood or not to take the blood? I don't understand your question. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm, yeah. Okay. Uh, back in the day, in the 80s, uh, when, uh, when AIDS first came out, everybody's, oh, you get it from gay or blood transfusions through the blood, it's through the blood, it's through the blood. So people didn't want to get transfusions, people didn't want to give blood, et cetera, et cetera. So now with sickle cell, which is an inherited uh, blood disorder in which you have low hemoglobin, et cetera, et cetera, how do you convince people whose lives could be drastically changed whether they take the blood or not take the blood, positive if yes, negative if no, um, to help them understand that Yes, anything's possible. You can still get hepatitis and all those things through the blood, but how do you convince them that that's a good option to take the blood because... In mm -hmm. Well, you, you ask about sickle cell and being the tra blood transfusion. I don't think we can blanketly tell... I personally can't blanketly tell you that because I don't know where that person is. It would be done for me in my own practice on an individual basis because, of course, patient choice is something they have. But I think there's enough literature to show, and you can look for data to convince the person that here are the number of persons who have seroconverted as a result of blood transfusions since so-and-so. And I don't think there's been any. Based on my literature review, I don't think there's been any. I mean, in the last 10 years, for sure. Not in this country. I do think that it boils down to some important information around HIV literacy uh, and about how the blood supply and education in general. Now, and so I think you're absolutely right that it depends on the patient in general. But I think what you begin with is some fundamental uh, education. You know, and that is you know, how safe is the blood supply? You know, and, and what are we doing to keep the blood supply safe? You know, HIV aside, I think that that's the conversation that you want to have. And then the second conversation that I think is an issue in our communities around health literacy in general. You know, and what are the consequences of the choices you make no matter what the choices are? But I think one of the issues that you bring up, and it's something that's it's interesting we haven't discussed yet, um, is really just a level of mistrust in our communities still, in the level of information that we receive, um, and which messages we trust 
um, which messengers we trust, um, and what type of information is conveyed. It's, it's really dismaying for me um, to continue to get into taxis or other places where I'm speaking to some people about what I do, and they ask, and they're like, yeah, the government has a cure for HIV, and they're hiding it somewhere. Or the government is going ahead and infecting African-American communities. And until we start dealing with some of those issues and those attitudes, we're going to have some problems in really effectively addressing HIV in our community. Uh, there have been recent studies that have shown that for black men who are HIV positive, those who had higher levels of mistrust, they believe that HIV AIDS medications didn't work, there was no reason to take those medications. Um, those were the men who had higher viral loads, um, were more likely to progress to AIDS compared to those men who had lower levels of mistrust. So these attitudes have bearing. They have bearing on whether or not people enter treatment. They have bearing on whether or not people even get tested for HIV, and it's something that we have to address. Next question. Well, I actually was just going to um, get to that point about the blood supply, because I think it's just important so everyone here knows. Um, first of all, there is no risk um, for getting HIV by giving blood. Um, there's just no risk. And secondly, uh, uh, Jen Cates from Kaiser Family Foundation, sorry. And secondly, um, in the United States at least, our blood supply is really, really, really safe. So what I would say to that um, young person is um, there, this, we have the safest blood supply in the world. There's really nothing for you to worry about. Of course, you can't 100% guarantee everything, but you have to compare the risks for yourself of not getting a transfusion for your health versus the potential minimal risk, if you live in the United States. I mean, that's, that's the caveat there. But I think just to everyone knows, we have a very safe blood supply. I don't think there's been a, a, trans, uh, a case for more than 10 years. I mean, it's been much, much longer. Good morning, my name is Brandy Franklin. I'm a health disparities researcher in Memphis, Tennessee, where um, we have a lot of challenges dealing with HIV AIDS. Um, and I'm not um, particularly engaged with that disease, but I have a colleague that works um, in that area. I wanted to hear more about some of the strategies related to either education through schools or um, initiatives or strategies that are working to target faith communities because I think those represent the barriers in Memphis, Tennessee to really um, addressing HIV AIDS and really seeking solutions um, within the community. So I, I'd love to hear your com more comments on that. Well, on the faith question, next week is the beginning, Sunday is the beginning of, of the Black Church Week of Prayer, the National Week of Prayer, uh, and it's a national campaign to engage churches. Uh, a number of programs, I think NAPWA has a faith-based program, a number of programs are engaging ministers, and that's increasingly happening. Uh, the, the, the challenge around in schools, you know, and that schools curricula and what you can do in schools are controlled by local school boards, and so uh, it requires an advocacy effort on that level. There are curricula that, that, are, that, that are available that local schools can then take and, uh, and apply uh, in their schools, but the decision you know, to, in fact, in include those kind of curricula is, is, is locally driven, uh, and, and HIV is often done in the context of sex education, and over the last decade or so, such education programs have been uh, uh, eroded, uh, and that's been exacerbated by an emphasis on abstinence only, you know, in which that the message is, is extremely narrow. I don't think that there are any AIDS advocates uh, who are opposed to an abstinent message, you know, or sex appropriate, age appropriate sex message. But I think that, that most of us believe that in a disease that's as serious as HIV, that we need to have comprehensive messages. And the data shows that when young people get a comprehensive message that is inclusive of abstinence uh, and age appropriate uh, sexual uh, contact uh, and, and talking about delayed gratification and responsibility uh, and, 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 and all that whole spectrum of things, that they are better equipped uh, to protect themselves from HIV than if they're given, uh, they're denied a comprehensive message. We are looking at HIV on HBCUs. And it took me almost three years to get 31 of the 105 or 104 HBCUs to even respond to questionnaires we have. And 84% of the respondents indicated that HIV is a problem on college campuses. 
and 75% said it's a problem on their campus. But I think what was most glaring from the paltry number of responders was 44% said if we want to even address HIV on college campuses, it needs to come from the presidents and the leaders at top. The things they're asking for, and right now we're actually looking at the number of minorities, at, uh, of number of students at HBCUs. What percent of the population is this? We've gotten up to about 8%, I'm told. And then we wanted to find out on these HBCU campuses, what percent is HIV positive? What is the school doing, even at this level, to educate patient, uh, students and faculty and the Student Health Center to make sure that when you leave, and we just came up with a nice slogan, and you will see the, the um, poster soon. It says, going to college to get a degree should not include HIV. <laughs> if the students don't know, and these are the creme de la creme of the students in the community, and they are at risk in our institutions, and we won't even talk about it there, they cannot be educated and be empowered to come out and be really and truly our next generation. So you asked what about the strategy? I think we have to continue talking, continue educating, and peer education is a big thing. When I look like you, I'm at your age and I talk to you and I give you the facts, oh, and you become a peer educator yourself. So it becomes a snowball. Each one teach one and become educated. I think that's the best way in terms of a strategy for us to do at a one-on-one -on -one point. Okay, we can take one last question. Um, hi, my name is Lisa Fager Bediaco with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. And Greg said something interesting, and it just hit me. It's, um, I live in the uh, Baltimore area, and we were talking about mistrust of, you know, medical institutions. And I mean, even with H1N1, people were like, mm, you know, I don't know. I mean, I haven't gotten it, but my doctor didn't either. So I was like, oh, I'm not getting it. She doesn't get it. Um, so. <laughs> Um, but but how do you break that barrier because the mistrust it comes from somewhere this is not the made-up boogeyman I mean Hopkins has a history of, of not being cool with the community still to this day as they knock down their neighborhood around them and you know Tuskegee and all these major institutions have really hurt black people I mean why wouldn't a black man be mistrusting of these folks I mean so what, what is the CDC doing to, to, to engage the community and, and build a trust level? I mean, I haven't really, you know, having worked in Baltimore uh, on the East Baltimore Project, if people aren't aware, but they're basically knocking down the neighborhood to create something that nobody's buy, bought into yet. But uh, they, they gave them a, an excuse to tear down the neighborhood, East Baltimore, um, and get rid of these people right, that, you know, um, it, Baltimore just has a, a big history. But I was just wondering, you know, still, Hopkins has still not done really this community outreach to um, build any trust with um, folks in the neighborhood. So wh what, what are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the question. And, and it's not just something you see in Baltimore. You see the same thing going on in Columbia and Harlem and many other places all across the country. And, you know, one of the major issues, and I, I, I hope Phil could, you know, talk about, he talked a little bit about, you know, AALI, the Leadership Institute, and what CDC is doing, and he can talk about that a little bit more. But um, one of the biggest issues that we have is that there's not enough people who look like us who are at these institutions. Um, and until you have some sort of critical number of people who are African American or Latino or Asian at these institutions who are reaching out in these communities, it's going to be difficult to break down some of these barriers of mistrust. And it's not just the barriers of mistrust until you have that critical number. It's even the type of research that we do or even the types of research questions that we ask are qualitatively different based upon where some of these groups come from, from your cultural background, from your perspective. Um, and we're seeing some of that now, some of the research that I was talking about, about individual risk behavior. A lot of that came from investigators of color and has just fundamentally changed how we look at risk at communities of color in the United States. We need more people of color at these institutions. We need more people of color who are doing this type of outreach. We need meet more people of color who are doing research uh, because that is the only way that we're really going to be able to uh, deal aggressively with some of the mistrust that we have out there. Um, 
I just wanted to add to that. Um, as a health professional, I think it's important for you to acknowledge and then educate. We have to acknowledge that historically there have been many things that have neg been done that have negatively impacted the African American community. But then at that point, you have to educate people about where we are now. And um, as you were saying before, even as it relates to HIV and AIDS testing, there are studies that unfortunately are showing that there is a difference in how physicians treat African American patients with HIV and AIDS versus non-African American patients. And so, you know, for someone who they're putting their trust, their, their life in the hands of someone else, you have to, I think you have to face it um, head on and acknowledge that, yes, historically there are these, these things that have happened, but then educate them about the process as we, we were just talking about with the sickle cell um, situation. You have to educate people and, and let them know, you know, where we are today. Thanks. Uh, I think the dealing with mistrust really starts way in the beginning. Uh, Health care reform is so critical for our community because as a person living with this disease for a long time, I immediately went to the doctor when I was diagnosed and only because of the previous experience I've had with the health care system, my mother believed in taking us to the doctor. So the trust and learning how to deal with doctors started real early for me. So by the time I was diagnosed with this disease, it was no doubt in my mind that I was going to a doctor. And I, I think that we have got to get it so that it just becomes part of the norm of our community. Mm -hmm. And I, the only way we're going to be able to do that is if we change what's happening in terms of our access to care. I think the takeaway message, you know, particularly in this group, uh, is that the messenger matters. You now, in the previous panel, we talked about the messenger matters. In this panel, the messenger uh, matters. You know, um, and one of the things that you can do as journalists. You know, you can amplify the messengers. You know, another story idea is to profile you know, people of color who are doing this work. You know, so that, that our community gets that, that, that we are engaged uh, in this. And now highlighting the fact that on HIV and AIDS that the NAACP is involved in the Urban League uh, and the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The messenger uh, matters. You know, uh, that's one of the reasons why we started the Greater Than AIDS campaign, you know, to deliver a message about us doing this ourselves, saving ourselves. And I think that's a critical message. You know, that, you know, the, the thing is, you know, you know on, on your point, Lisa, you know, just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean I'm wrong. You know, uh, and, and I think that's part of what goes on in the community. But as we, as we build, and I guess, you know, I'll end where I started, and that is that unless and until we take ownership of the disease, unless we build, you know, a national movement that is of us, by us, responding to this epidemic, you know, and saying, you know, yes, maybe there, there's a role that government should play, there's a role that, that corporations should play, there's a role that foundations should play, there's a role that all these other folks should play. But if they don't, we have a responsibility to save ourselves. Now, and, and that's an important message that we need to get out there. Because if we are doing the saving, then that eliminates the whole, well, maybe not eliminates, but it dramatically reduces the conspiracy construct. You know, uh, and and so, so on that note, if you want information about the Greater Than AIDS, you know, as you can tell, I know how to deliver messages. Uh, if you want information about the Greater Than AIDS campaign, you can go to greaterthanaids.org. Uh, we have cards. Uh, that you can get information uh, uh, about the campaign. Um, you can go to blackaids.org if you want any of our materials. We have tons and tons of support materials, you know, reports that we produce, city sheets that we produce, any information to help you deliver a story that's primarily, uh, you know, that, that's about 30 percent of what we do is to help journalists write stories about HIV and AIDS. Uh, we work with NAPWA all the time. Uh, we work with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation all the time. If you need speakers, if you need names of people to profile, whatever you need, uh, we are about making it as easy as possible for you to cover the story. Okay. We're going to have to wrap up with that. And I just really want to thank you all so much for coming here and sharing all this great information with us. A lot of great story ideas came out of your presence, and we're grateful, and we appreciate the work that you do, too.